Michael Burry has taken aim at what he perceives to be ESG hyperbole, albeit in a slightly indelicate tweet that was primarily focusing on climate rhetoric. Indeed, this is very much Arcle Bohr. It's against the grain, given that media commentators through to investors are focusing on ESG investing. Indeed, anyone who questions the financial case for ESG investing can suffer career consequences, as the former head of responsible investing at HSBC found out. So the question then is, does Michael Burry have a point? Is it the case that there's a lot of hyperbole in the sector? Or is he really just off base here, spreading fringe theories? That's what I'm going to look at in this video. And as usual, Michael Burry has thought-provoking comments here. I don't think he is totally correct, but he is right to point out that there's a lot of junk science within the ESG sector. And it's absolutely the case. You need to disentangle hyperbole from fact for you to come up with a clear and strong investment case. Nevertheless, if you have any thoughts about what Michael Burry is saying, I would be interested to hear that in the comments below. I should say at the outset, I'm not a massive fan of ESG investing. I don't appreciate people telling me what to do with my own money. Furthermore, if you are a fund manager, you have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize returns for your clients, not go out and pursue social or political goals that you have. And indeed, many ESG indexes are so vague, are so nebulous, are so arbitrary, that they can be constructed to reflect whatever the policy or social goal that particular individual has. And that ultimately means that ESG indexes aren't necessarily correlated with returns after controlling for other risk factors that could affect performance. So I do have serious misgivings about a lot of ESG investing. But that is, of course, tangential to what Michael Burry is saying. Let's start by looking at what Michael Burry has said specifically. And as usual, this is in a slightly opaque tweet. Which states? I grew up with an ice age, acid rain, overpopulation, and a global famine, and a giant hole in the ozone layer caused by Aquanet. All to wipe us out shortly if we did not change drastically and fast. So it is hot now in July. In essence, Michael Burry is saying here that almost every few years, someone says that the human population is likely to die or suffer catastrophic consequences. Now, of course, there's a valid question about whether those predictions were correct. After all, if we're looking at acid rain, people predicted there would be acid rain and that would be damaging. Then regulations came along to stop acid rain and then acid rain decreased. So indeed, acid rain could have been a lot worse if we didn't intervene. So I think Michael Burry is slightly ignoring that fact right here. He's ignoring what we did to prevent these things becoming catastrophes. But that's a slightly separate issue that I'll get to a little bit later. He then also links to an other article and several images extracted from that article. So the first of these images is from 1989 and states, rising seas could obliterate nations, UN officials. In the first paragraph, it then goes on and says, a senior UN environmental official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if global warming is not reversed by the year 2000. Now, indeed, this warning could have been slightly early. Certainly, none of these nations were obliterated by 2000. And certainly back in the 1990s, people didn't seem to be taking climate change particularly seriously. So absolutely, this warning might have been a little bit too prescient. However, Michael Burry himself is often slightly early in calling market downturns. Now, granted in this case, no nations were wiped off the face of the earth by 2000. However, that doesn't mean that global warming isn't an issue. It just means that they called the ramifications of it slightly too early. And the mere fact that we have more time to deal with it doesn't mean that it is not an issue. Nevertheless, he is right to point out that maybe they're a little bit incorrect in their prediction in this article. The next one here is from 1978. And what they're attempting to do here is illustrate a contradiction between a media article and data coming from NASA. So the media article states here, no end in sight to a 30 year cooling trend. Then they argue from the NASA data that according to NASA, there'd been a slight warming trend since 1979. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this is trying to illustrate, because with climate change, you can have both warming and cooling in different locations. Furthermore, climate change often involves more extreme and more frequent weather events, which themselves can be more damaging, notwithstanding whether it's getting warmer or cooler. 
So I'm not entirely sure what this excerpt aims to illustrate. Maybe it's aiming to illustrate that sometimes the media rhetoric doesn't totally line up with the data. Furthermore, from the 1970s, data was much more difficult to analyze in 1970s. Computers were much less of a thing. So dealing with big data would have been much more difficult back in 1970s. So I'm not entirely sure it is fair to look at the 1970s and say, well, maybe things weren't executed as ideally as would be the case. And then saying that that invalidates what we're finding right now. So I'm not entirely sure what this picture or what this excerpt is supposed to be telling us too much or what we can very much learn from it. The next article is from 2013 and it states, the Arctic could be ice free by 2016. And in this excerpt, they go on and say, an ongoing US Department of Energy backed research project led by US Navy scientists predicted the Arctic could lose its summer ice cover as early as 2016, 84 years ahead of conventional model projections. The project, based out of the US Naval Postgraduate School's Department of Oceanography, uses complex modeling techniques to make its projections more accurate than others. Now here, obviously, this prediction didn't actually occur. The Arctic still has ice. However, there are still concerns with ice covering in the Arctic. So the mere fact that they overestimated the concerns doesn't necessarily invalidate the qualitative conclusion, which is that we need to do something about issues with Arctic ice cover. Furthermore, there's an issue with this article, which often arises in the academic space, which is that there's a working paper, a work in progress that people are still kind of contemplating on. Maybe they're refining their statistical models. Maybe they're doing some more robustness tests. Then a media article leaps onto a headline grabbing finding that hasn't necessarily been finalized. Now the whole academic evidence looks like it is shonky, even though it was never finalized. To use an analogy, it can be like baking a cake. When you're baking a cake, you put the ingredients into your mixing bowl and then ultimately will go into the oven and get baked. An academic paper can be similar in that you need to do various statistical tests, you need to interpret those tests, and then you put it all together, hopefully coming up with a robust finding. So continuing our cake analogy, if someone comes along and takes a photo of your unfinished cake, it will look like poop. If you haven't yet added the butter, it won't even be a proper cake. So someone might misinterpret what the end result is going to be by looking at it partway along the line. The same thing can happen with academic evidence. If someone comes along and looks at your academic evidence before it's been finalized, before it's been properly tested for robustness, they might come up with an inaccurate conclusion. Sometimes academics can be to blame for this. They can go to the media with what looks like an exciting finding, even though they haven't properly ensured that it is robust. Furthermore, sometimes the media is also complicit in this, scouting out these headline-grabbing findings. Or sometimes they just look at working papers that haven't passed peer review. And in that case, it's really a little bit difficult to draw final conclusions from it. The media has just gone out on its own and not necessarily based on what the evidence is saying. That said, circling back around to the article, the mere fact that they were a little bit too quick in their prediction doesn't mean that there aren't concerns we need to address anyway. The final one that I'll look at is from 1969. And it says here, the trouble with almost all environmental problems, says Paul Ehrlich, the population biologist, is that by the time we have enough evidence to convince people, you're dead. We must realize that unless we are extremely lucky, everyone will disappear in a cloud of blue steam before 20 years. Now, I think that later one is probably a little bit facetious. He is being intentionally hyperbolic. He was obviously not meaning the people are going to disappear into a cloud of blue steam. It's not going to be a Kingsman type scenario where everyone's heads just kind of puff off into a cloud of smoke. Rather, we are more looking at hyperbole here, a degree of sarcasm about what is happening. So I think it's a little bit unfair to look at this and take it at face value. Nevertheless, it's getting at the idea that sometimes people do take a long time to convince of data that is going on whether or not that's in climate-related factors or anything else. So he does raise a valid point that people can be slow to accept what is a genuine scientific finding. However, there can be reasons for this. Certainly, what is commonly accepted scientific wisdom can change over time. That's how science works. You might find something right now, but then using new techniques or new models or new data comes along, and you refine what that finding is. 
Now, science often operates like that, which makes it look slightly contradictory. But in reality, it's just people coming along with new data and new insights. Now, when people realize that's the case, they can be slightly slow to accept a new finding because they don't know whether it is truly robust. And that, to some extent, can have sense in that if you don't know if this scientific finding has been cross-validated by someone else, if you don't know if it's robust, if you don't know what can be replicated, then people can be right to be a little bit slow to take up that information because they don't know whether it will be the case in another year's time. They don't know whether another research finding is going to support it. So I think a degree of skepticism is healthy. It is absolutely right to ask, does this scientific evidence make sense? Or is it really just going to be overthrown in another year's time? Nevertheless, this media article, or at least Michael Murray's reference to it, is trying to get at the idea that there can be scare campaigns that aren't necessarily grounded in evidence. Now, the next question is whether Michael Burry is correct. Does Michael Burry have a point about this? Now, he's clearly being slightly provocative and is focused a little bit more on climate-related rhetoric, but of course, there are parallels for ESG investing. Now, I'll start off by looking at where I think Michael Burry is incorrect. Firstly, I think he's incorrect about his characterization of climate change. Climate change doesn't just involve the world getting warmer or cooler, it can involve more extreme weather events in general, i.e. more hurricanes and tornadoes or forest fires. And the exact nature of them will depend upon the area in which the world is affected. So it's too simplistic to just say the world is getting warmer or cooler, rather one needs to look at the full panoply of climate events to get at what is happening in relation to climate change. The second area I think he's wrong is about regulatory interventions, and specifically why some of the concerns are no longer issues. So Michael Burry pointed out the hole in the ozone layer, or acid rain. Well, regulatory interventions have been part of the reason those are less of a concern. Indeed, reducing CFCs helped to resolve the ozone layer issue. Acid rain regulation, such as the acid rain project in the United States, helped to reduce acid rain. And that's why acid rain is no longer as much of an issue. Indeed, there are clear corporate ramifications that some co-authors and I have found in relation to the acid rain project. So it certainly has had an impact. So I think he is glossing over some of the underlying reasons these things aren't actually concerns. They're not concerns now because we did something about them. Now that brings me to where I think Michael Burry is correct. The first area is in relation to the boy who cried wolf type fable. I had the idea that if we're going out and saying that everything is going to cause us to dissolve into blue sludge, and we're doing that too frequently, then people are going to stop believing what scientists are saying. Because if we keep overstating results, then you end up with people having no trust of what those results mean. So it is absolutely important for the media, for investors, and for scientists to be accurate and appropriately circumspect when conveying scientific evidence. This also feeds into investment. It is 100% appropriate and indeed legally required for investors to be accurate when they're explaining their likely investment results. Put differently, if an ESG fund says that a particular type of investment has a particular impact on returns, they need to justify that. It can't just be hand-waving. It can't just be, if we invest in fossil fuels, then these fossil fuel companies are going to drop off the edge of a cliff. No one wants coal. They can't just say that without it being backed up by evidence. And if ESG investors continue to make wrong calls, then people are going to stop investing in those companies, even if those companies were ultimately going to be beneficial. For example, we've seen oil companies do quite well, as people have realized we're going to need oil for an extended period of time, similarly with natural gas, and to a lesser extent with coal, which has seen an uplift. So people need to be appropriately precise in their language, rather than just throwing out scare headlines or throwing out overstatements, because then people will no longer believe them. And that's a lesson that ESG investors, so ESG fund managers, need to learn when they're going out and convincing clients to invest in them. Put differently, clearly demonstrate why there is a cash flow benefit to investing in a particular climate change related technology, and demonstrate that in a way that is appropriately grounded and is appropriately backed up by real evidence. Secondly, Michael Burry is getting at the idea from these headlines that people are often making emotive decisions. Indeed, there was a recent paper accepted 
into the Review of Financial Studies, which is one of the top three finance journals, that shows that investors investing in impact companies are often doing so for the emotional uplift, the endorphins they get from having a feel-good feeling of doing something good for the world, rather than because there's a genuine financial benefit. Put differently, they're susceptible to greenwashing. Now, from an investment perspective, this has two sub-ramifications. Firstly, investors need to be very cautious they're not being misled by greenwashing. I need to, they need to be very cautious that they are not being misled by an unscrupulous fund manager that is simply selling them something that won't actually occur. Furthermore, the fund managers need to be appropriately mindful of this and they need to be careful not to mislead their investors. And the more people sell these feel-good investments that don't ultimately result in returns, the less people are going to be willing to invest in impact-related technologies and that ultimately is going to be harmful more generally. Now, the final thing that we need to learn from this is that it's important to not cancel people who question what the orthodoxy is. Similarly, in the ESG space, we need to avoid firing someone for simply questioning whether there's a financial case for ESG investing. The mere fact that someone doesn't cohere to what the dominant orthodoxy is doesn't mean we should get rid of them, particularly when they are making cogent arguments that are well enunciated. Stuart Kirk would be case in point here, that former head of responsible investing at HSBC, who was seemingly fired for questioning the financial case for ESG investing. He wasn't even questioning climate change. He wasn't questioning anything along those lines. What he was questioning is the financial case for ESG investing and some of the financial rhetoric surrounding it, and highlighting that when you've got more and more hyperbole, you're going to run into that boy who cried wolf type situation, where people stop believing you the more and more extreme you get with your rhetoric. I completely get that there is a competition for funding. I completely get that at the end of your central bank career, there are still many, many years to fill in. You've got to say something. You've got to fly around the world to conferences. You've got to out hyperbole the next guy. But I feel like it's getting a little bit out of hand. The constant reminder that we are doomed, the constant reminder that within decades it's all over. And indeed, Sharon said, we are not going to survive. And indeed, no one ran from the room. In fact, most of you barely looked up from your mobile phones at the prospect of non-survival. It's become so hyperbolic that no one really knows how to get anyone's attention at all. So overall, does Michael Burry have a point? Well, he has a point in relation to some things in the ESG space. He has a point about hyperbole. He has a point about sometimes people making decisions that aren't necessarily fully supported or just feel good decisions. He makes a very good point about hyperbole in general and about the idea of the boy who cried wolf and the idea of not overhyping a particular result. Because if you overhype something that ultimately doesn't come to fruition, then people will stop believing you. However, I do think that Michael Burry slightly oversimplifies climate change and slightly glosses over some of the regulatory interventions that have been done to try to reduce some of the environmental issues that he has referenced. Nevertheless, if you have any thoughts about what he is saying, or any thoughts about ESG investing in general, do let me know that in the comments below. And otherwise, of course, it would be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And hopefully I will see you for future videos as well.